Okay, so maybe maybe I start with a quick introduction. Um, so welcome everyone uh, to, to, to today's uh, CDY lecture, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Anna Nellis uh, from Daisy and also uh, the Friedrich uh, Alexander University in Erlangen as today's CDY speaker. Uh, so Anna is an astroparticle physicist, and she has a special interest in the radio detection of neutrinos and cosmic rays. Um, her PhD thesis was on the study of radio emission of air showers with uh, the LOFAR telescope. Um, Anna is currently leading an Emmy Nether group at the uh, HU Berlin and, and Daisy uh, Zoytin, and she's involved in several projects, including Ariana experiment, the Pierre Auger, LOFAR key science project, Cosmic Rays, and she, her speciality is in the radio detection of neutrinos above PEV energies. Uh, so this fall, as you know, those of you who have been coming regularly, we are focusing on topics of multi-messenger, GRBs, gravitational waves, and neutrinos. And the title of today's talk is High Energy Neutrinos, Radio Detection of Ultra-High Energy UHE Neutrinos at Multi-PEV Energies and Above. So let me also remind you that we will have the next CDY talk next Wednesday, so it's just a week from today, November 16th, um, and then that will at the usual time, and this will put us back on our regular schedule of every other week. And today's was a one-time special seminar um, at, a, at a different cadence. So just a reminder that we are back for a CDY lecture next week, November 16th, Wednesday at the usual time. And the topic that we will do next Wednesday is the one that's the, on the recent um, interesting results that IceCube announced via their webinar. I'm sure several of you must have joined that, uh, but we'll have a special one also at the CDY and we will have uh, Elisa Rasconi and hopefully a few other speakers that we are trying to get uh, for, for that day. But for today, let us welcome Anna and get started. As a reminder, Anna's talk will be roughly 50 minutes and then we will follow up with questions. And you should feel free to use the chat function um, for the general discussion. Um, and, and also a reminder to everyone that we will be recording the session for our YouTube archives. And if you're not speaking, please remember to mute yourselves. So thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for, for agreeing and please get started. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So um, I think uh, the, the title uh, that I gave you is slightly different than the one I have on my slides here, but I think the content should be um, what I promised. So I'll talk about um, radio detection of astrophysical neutrinos. And really what I'm interested in is sort of towards finding the sources of uh, ultra high energy cosmic rays. And uh, clearly uh, I've been excited, as excited as everyone about last week's ice cube results, because you know, whenever our optical colleagues find something that means uh, it puts neutrinos again on the map and uh, that's uh, good for everyone in the field, I think. Okay, so let's just um, start briefly with um, a, a short scientific motivation of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so this is, you know, this famous multi-messenger plot that you've probably seen in about, uh, I don't know, 200 re different reincarnations that shows you sort of the gamma ray measurements, the ice cube neutrino measurements, and the cosmic rays um, as measured by the PRG observatory. And for me now, what's relevant is sort of this, this forest of, uh, of models that you see in the middle here. And those are sort of of two classes. And um, I think I've got about 20 more that I could put in there, but then the plot gets uh, very confusing. So you have the reddish lines, which are sort of something that um, has something to do with sort of astrophysical objects, sort of what I call astrophysical neutrinos. Um, so like from AGNs or from blazars or these things. So models that actually predict some neutrino flux from a source. And then you have at the same time, you have models um, that I always refer to as cosmogenic neutrinos. Those that are generated when protons that have been accelerated in a source travel through the universe, interact with various photon backgrounds in the universe and create neutrinos. So we can haggle over which models are realistic or not. And I uh, <clears throat> have been told by many of my theory colleagues that one should have strong opinions about these. But I think for me, as a, I'm a real experimental phys physicist, the only takeaway is, is that somewhere in this big uncharted regimes, we're expecting a lot of neutrinos um, that will tell us a lot more about the sources. And so how do we, how do we actually find these? So how do we, how do we tackle this? So how do you address this problem? You can have uh, either you measure more neutrinos, and this is clearly where sort of my work 
and from others are going into sort of extending ice cube, going to higher energies, because you really can see that if we were to measure whatever happens to the neutrino flux at higher energies, it would help us disentangle all those model predictions. Because I want to be honest about it, there are also, if you look at it closer, there are also some predictions that sort of really are two orders of magnitude lower in this figure as a prediction. So clearly, um, they have lots of implications if we even weren't to measure a neutrino. So you could do this, or you could sort of even come from the other side, you need to measure cosmic rays with a better precision. That's not probably not the super best plot to show this, because of course, the questions about what is the origin of cos ultra energy cosmic rays is very much um, closely related to the composition of those cosmic rays. So um, as you, I'm sure you are aware, sort of the measuring cosmic rays with better precision, actually being able to entangle the composition at earth would also help narrow down the differences between those lines. So this is um, where we sit. And this is now where radio emission of showers enters. And I'm fully aware that radio emission of showers is not a sort of textbook topic that everybody works through. Um, and maybe for the younger people here, um, I started my PhD in uh, 2010. And I um, I can quote somebody who told me, um, who literally told me that uh, uh, they thought that I was being nuts of entering this field of radio detection because it was this terrible field of where people didn't even know how the emission worked. People were arguing over sort of orders of magnitude in emission prediction. And um, then they were at the same time building experiments to measure these and they were very confused by the results. So I entered this field in a time where things were a little more confusing than they are now, but now we can finally sort of tell you a very clear and clean cut story about how radio emission of showers works and uh, sort of slowly it is entering textbook physics, but I'll take the time to explain this a little bit. So in order to make radio emission from a shower, so you of course need a shower. So this is something, keep this in mind later for neutrinos. It, you know, you don't need muons or you don't need other things, you need showers. So when you have the shower, um, three ingredients help you to make emission from this. And this is part one, this is a magnetic field. So if you think of an air shower and that air shower develops in the atmosphere, what happens is sort of you have a geomagnetic field that interacts with your shower, Lorentz force, and you'll get the emission from it. And that happens basically in a way as it is depicted here in this little cartoon, is that the um, magnetic field moves sort of showers left and right, and then um, uh, particles left and right, and then you get a charge separation, and that gives rise to um, electric field change, which we can measure. Then the second part is basically particle physics, so that when a shower develops, you um, your shower front as it moves forward is negatively charged. So that is simply because in the atmosphere, there are more electrons than there are protons. And so therefore you get emission. And then to make matters complicated, this whole thing happens in a medium with a index of refraction that is not unity and in a highly relativistic um, complex. So you end up getting sort of relativistic compression that makes the emission complicated. So this very nice picture wasn't clear when we started for this, but um, the nice thing is now that we actually, from where we are now, um, we know this. So we've used air showers, and this is during my time of my PhD and before, we've used air showers to actually explain this picture. How with the three things, with this geomagnetic process, with the particle physics process in shower development, and finally with having this all in a relativistically compressed medium, um, we can create the emission. So I could take about 20 minutes explaining all of this in detail, but um, I never know sort of how, how well prepared the audience is. So if you have questions about these emission mechanisms, I'm happy to talk about this in the discussion later. So let me, I just said most of our knowledge comes from air showers. So let me start with air showers here because um, the question usually is, are we sure that we've really understood how all this works? So um, in air showers, we really have quite a lot of experimental evidence. And I think now we can finally say, um, the main things are settled. So um, we really checked all of it. We've checked the signal distribution, the signal amplitude, the signal polarization, the frequency spectrum and dependence on the magnetic field and everything checks out as compared to our simulations with a, which is a very good thing to have. So let me try to explain to you a couple of these little figures that you see out here. So let's take the blue and yellow one at the top. So this is a result from LOFAR where you're basically in the shower, you're, you're sort of in the shower and what we're showing is the shower plane as it hits the ground. 
And what you see is these little dots that are in there, and those are the low far antennas. They're funnily oriented. That's why um, you see sort of these clusters. And every one of these low far antennas measures a signal. <clears throat> and the signal amplitude is given in a color. And um, so you see we have some dark blue colors, and we have some um, red and um, yellow um, colors. And overlaid is an air shower simulation showing the same thing in the background. And what you see is that most colors agree very, very nicely. Um, this is great. So that means we've understood what we're measuring. But it also tells you sort of why radio emission was sort of confusing to many people in a, for a long time, because it's not symmetric. So the shower axis really is at zero, zero, and you see it in some sort of a, like a depleted region. And then you see this kidney bean shaped to one side, and then you see it fall off. And what happens here has something to do with a po signal polarization, that the geomagnetic effect, so the charge separation caused by the Earth magnetic field, leads to a signal that's polarized <clears throat> in this coordinate system in the V cross B axis. So all the signal polarizations are aligned with the V cross B axis. The second emission, the sometimes also called Ascarian effect, there the signal polarization is not aligned with V cross B, but it's sort of rotationally symmetric around the shower axis. So if you add both of these up, then on one side, it's really just vector addition. So on one side of the shower core, the vectors are aligned, so you get strong signals. And on the other side, they're co-aligned, so then uh, you get uh, destructive interference and you get small signals. So there you get, then you end up with this asymmetric footprint around this. And if you do this, what air shower physicists usually do, you plot this as a 1D lateral distribution function, then this thing looks very, very confusing because there's no clear sign of as a function of distance to the shower axis, what this looks like. So, but only looking at this in T 2D helps us to understand what's going on. Okay. And then at the bottom, you can also see that sort of, um, we've plotted the polarization really. Um, so for every low far antenna, you see a polarization vector here and you see that the overall alignment is along the V cross B axis, but you have slightly sort of the, the lower ones are slightly below and the upper ones are slightly above which is basically um, that calculation. And then you can go to higher frequencies, which is the middle figure on the um, bottom row. And to higher frequencies, you get the Cherenkov cone being more pronounced. And then you end up really with a cone. And if you go to even higher frequencies, this cone gets more and more pronounced. And in the end, it looks more, you sort of lose this funny asymmetry. And then finally, the last one that was circular polarization, that was sort of the ultimate um, icing on the cake checking that the two emission mechanisms, the geomagnetic me mechanism and the Ascarian emission air shower, they're slightly offset in time because they've come from slightly different heights. That means we don't get fully linear polarization, but a little bit of um, time delay and that leads to elliptical polarization. And that also same concept, the, the circular polarization we measure is shown in the little dots and the background tells you the prediction. So um, very complicated. And for those of you who hear this for the first time, probably you go, how am I supposed to digest all of this? But I think the bottom line is what I want you all to take away is that we do understand radio emission um, of showers. It, we have lots of experimental evidence and um, we know how to simulate this very well. So um, we can go forward. So this is um, a little cartoon showing you what I sort of said in words earlier, that the key evidence really is this polarization where the geomagnetic effect as you see on the left, has all these little arrows pointing to one side and the Ascarian effect having all the little arrows pointing towards the shower axis. So that if you add them up, you get exactly this figure that we've seen on the side before, where you get sort of an enhancement on one side and a depletion on the other side. So this is um, the other key evidence with the polarization. Um, I've just um, talked about this before. But there's one point I want to make about this um, this plot here. So the circular polarization really was sort of uh, very complicated to get. And we got this out of LOFAR. And we're very thankful that we have LOFAR because it requires this super accurate timing that um, only LOFAR can offer us. So um, I think overall, um, the emission of air showers in air is both due to geomagnetic and Ascarian emission. And when we move to ice, as we will later, Ascarian emission becomes more and more um, dominant. There has been around this prediction of something called the geosynchrotron radiation. Um, that is still around, sort of, um, but it seems to be that in sort of, how am I going to say this, in, in sort of thick materials like air is at um, sort of our latitudes, 
um, it's really a correction of less than 1% to all of these effects. So um, we do see this in our microscopic simulation, but it's no, not a dominant effect. So then you would, this polarization signal would signature would look very, very different if this was synchrotron radiation. Okay, then also one thing that's sort of a technicality that it's sort of, this is a Cherenkov ring, but it's not a Cherenkov emission. So it really, you would, um, uh, if, if our showers were to develop in vacuum, we would still see it. You would see it slightly different, you know, if you could take the entire shower as it is with the same particles to vacuum. Um, but so what it is, is really here, it's sort of a, a, a compression of the signal. Um, that we see. So it's um, it's very much related to Cherenkov radiation, but it's um, not precisely the same effect. Okay, this all was very, very complicated. And, uh, you know, uh, it took, uh, well, it took me at least my PhD to understand it. I'm uh, always confident that my graduate students do not take as long as I did back then. But um, coming back sort of to the physics, what I said in the beginning is really these air shower measurements were great. They They taught us so much about how all of this worked. Um, and sort of how to do this in principle, they taught us how to work reconstruction mechanisms because, you know, all of a sudden you would have to, you have to go to Fourier space, which is something that um, sort of with particle air shower physics, you never really have to do. And we were able to really test all our Monte Carlo simulations to, I think now really down to the systematic uncertainties, um, which is great. So we're using Corsica plus um, uh, extension to Corsica called Coreas. So it is part of the standard Corsica release to simulate all of these um, emissions. And um, so this, is, this has been really great. But overall, sort of when you're a scientist, you know, it's, it's sort of, it gives you fulfillment to see that you can simulate everything right. But a technique to me is only useful if it can contribute to sort of advancing the astroparticle science case. For instance, sort of, you know, can you make using radio emission, can you make a cosmic ray energy spectrum? Can you look at cosmic ray composition? Can you maybe do air shower physics or, you know, can you find the sources of ultra high energy cosmic rays? And before we jump over to neutrinos later, I wanted to give the air showers the credit that uh, they are due by having taught us so much about the emission themselves. And that's um, something that's um, sort of um, one of the first results that um, Auger has published uh, regarding the radio emission of air showers is showing that radio detection of air showers provides really an excellent energy estimator. So let me walk you through this figure. On the side, it's a bit older already, but it, you know, we can make this now with more statistics, but the general um, result hasn't changed. So you see on the y-axis, you see basically a radio energy estimator, sort of it's the energy deposited in the radio emission between 30 and 80 megahertz divided by um, the sign between the shower, shower and the magnetic field that has to do with this symmetry. And that is set out on the x-axis against the cosmic ray energy. And you see a very nice correlation, and you also see a lot of scatter. But the interesting thing is, is that you can explain all of this scatter essentially by the Auger surface detector. So the way how the particle detectors need sort of extrapolations to do energy and these things. So the scatter itself of all of this figure is explained by the particle detectors. So that means that radio emission has to be much, much better in energy estimating than a particle array. And the nice thing is you, we also have very little systematic uncertainties because when you look at fluorescence detectors, they have things like with clouds and bad weather and moon and all of these things. And for radio, I used to work in the Netherlands. So that's when I usually said, you know, there's a reason why the Netherlands is strong in radio astronomy. Radio does not care about bad weather. So uh, that's um, why with radio, we don't have to do, or we have to do very little atmospheric monitoring um, radio is very robust against all of these things. So if you do this calculation from first principles, um, as it's done by some of my colleagues in simulations, it really has less than 5% um, method uncertainty um, from this. So we have no hadronic interaction systematics or something. So if you measure the energy deposit in an, in an air shower, you get a very, very good energy estimator for um, your um, incoming particle. So that's great. That's great for the science. And um, we've also tested this, um, or that a radio um, array could actually reduce the systematic uncertainties between observatories. So for instance, you are probably all aware about this sort of this debate between um, OJ and TA of who got the energy spectrum right. And that in the end, it boils down to systematics sort of on the energy scale. So if you, for instance, um, were to put the same radio array once at one side and once at the other side, you basically could take the radio energy scale and have that fixed. 
And this is something sort of, we've tried this between OJ and LOFAR. And um, essentially in this figure, you see the purple line and the green line, and um, both of them represent, this is LOFAR data. The LOFAR data pretty well, um, of course, LOFAR and the particle array at LOFAR was never made for high accuracy uh, reconstruction. So we're dominated by LOFAR uncertainties, but I would really, I'm really curious to see if how, how one would fare with a better air shard detector. So, and then one final last thing about radio is it's great. It's sen very sensitive to Xmaxin, which is a proxy for the particle type. And this is geometry. So you see this here on the right. If you have a shower that's really high up, radio just illuminates a wider footprint than one that's closer. So the distance to Xmax is, and Xmax itself is clearly related to the particle type. So, and with, with LOFA, we've published here um, this Xmax result. And um, it's sort of Xmax as a function of um, energy compared to all other measurements and the proton lines and the iron lines. And it's very interesting that it seems to be that there's some tension between sort of Auger and all the other experiments that are on the Northern hemisphere. It is somewhat odd because I think none of us can really think of why there would be a composition difference between the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. Um, but, um, you know, it is what it is. Um, I think we've turned our data upside down multiple times in order to find any systematic uncertainty that would bring us closer to Auger. And um, we've been unable to find anything and this is our best estimate. But this clearly to me shows you that there's a potential for a radio measurement on the Southern hemisphere. So um, something like SKA, and if we could use this for air showers, that would be very exciting. So let's, um, let's uh, sort of, why don't we just do this? Let me brief you a little bit about sort of what are experimental challenges and opportunities in detecting radio emission. And this holds both for neutrinos and for um, air showers. It's only that with air showers, we actually have detected air showers. So it's uh, much easier to tell you with the pictures that we have. So what you do is in order to find this with all this me mechanism, just think about this real brief. We're searching for a very broadband nanosecond scale pulse. It doesn't repeat, it doesn't come from a predicted direction, it just shows up. So and at the bottom you see what the um, what a LOFAR version of this pulse actually looks like. So you see an amplitude as a function of time and you have this tiny broadband pulse that just jumps up from the noise. Um, it is typically nowadays detectable at sort of shower energies of PEV, um, but that means if you look at the spectrum of, of cosmic rays or at neutrinos at PEV energies, it definitely will be a very rare signal. And if you compare this low-far detection now um, uh, in the bottom panel to what's at the top, so this is what the early air shower experiments looked like. So you have an oscillator running and you have at the top, you have sort of the oscilloscope with a little pulse that's shown. And I think the two dots that you sort of see here, um, those are actually the particle signals that triggered this readout. So Back in those days, I really cannot, uh, you know, I, I cannot be angry at the people who said that, you know, this radio detection stuff will never work. It's really just the advent of and the very <clears throat> fast digital electronics and sort of smart ASICs that actually lets us do this. Because you have quite extreme requirements for electronics. So you need sampling speeds of at least 200 megahertz. Or, you know, if you want to go to the neutrino route, um, you we're currently requiring at least two gigahertz of sampling. You want full waveform sampling for to actually be able to resolve your frequency content and the polarization. And preferably, your stations run independently at very low power because you need to instrument a lot of volume with it. Um, so this is when you ask somebody to build electronics for you, they usually say OK to the first two bullets. And then the last one is like, wow, you want to do this on like a 15 watt electronics budget? I don't think so. So. Um, this is the complicated thing about it, and uh, but it's challenging, and that's of course what makes physics fun. And if you now think of it, that you want to look at um, look at this sort of uh, points where you can find uh, uh, radio emission is sort of what I brought here is you have a little bit of a problem that many things make radio emission. So here is a parameter called the correlation. So this is a template correlation analysis as a function of time, and this is for from the Ariana collaboration one year of data, and I just plotted all the data. And what you see, there are many, many events that sit there, and only a couple of them, these um, purple ones, are cosmic rays that jump out of you. So it really 
it really is sort of that you have to distinguish somehow from this enormous amount of background, you have to find the cosmic rays. And those are cosmic rays. They're even abundant. So think of if you want to find the neutrino here in one year of data, we have expected zero and we have so many triggers already. So self triggering and event identification really remains a challenge. Oh, somehow the quality is really bad, but you can sort of see the two examples at the bottom. And let me tell you, one of them is a cosmic ray and the other one is not. And I think by eye, none of you will be able to tell because you see some noisy pulse that's um, going forward. And um, that's, I think, uh, um, all that we have. But we do have very nice opportunities in modern, modern data analysis methods. So um, uh, we can, you know, we're no longer scared of having to do a 10 to the minus nine background reduction. So for those who are curious, that one is no cosmic ray and that one is a cosmic ray. You know, this is um, how close all of these are together. So this was um, about general challenges and air showers. So let's jump into the neutrino part of things um, because that's what I'm here for. So why is it interesting for neutrinos? It is interesting because any, electro any shower containing an electromagnetic cascades creates radio emission. And as you know, when a neutrino of the highest energy interacts in the earth, you usually get a big shower. And that is, um, uh, for one, this is sort of, um, it can be a, 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 you know, a charge current interaction giving you an electron, then you have an electromagnetic shower. You could have neutral current interaction, always giving you hydronic showers. So there are many cases in which neutrinos gives you showers. So you have a similar experimental approach for air showers stemming from cosmic rays, neutrino induced tau decays, or even an in ice um, neutrino reaction. I'll, I'll focus a little bit on the last one, but I'll cover uh, all the other topics as well. So um, you overall, I think the general problem is you need something denser than air to provide a decent target because you need a lot of material for the neutrino to cover in order to actually create a shower. And the nice thing that in ice, you have a kilometer scale attenuation length. So radio ice is transparent for radio emission. So it is kind of a natural um, way to go. Well, this is uh, sort of in natural life, what it looks like uh, when we actually do this. So this is, um, and I talk about this um, later a bit more, uh, RNOG installation in Greenland. So when you think of it's only just planning and ideas, this is really actually what life of a physicist um, is like. So briefly, radio emission of neutrino showers in a very small nut nutshell. So I've talked about air showers for quite a while, but I want to highlight a couple of differences to neutrinos. Is that um, overall, neutrino pulses are much higher frequency and they're sort of, um, they have have so therefore shorter so in radio detection it's uh, uh, quite interesting to see is that if you have a broad pulse there's lots of low frequency in there but if you have a very sharp and a very narrow pulse there's lots of high frequencies in there and um, despite no one ever having detected a neutrino in radio we can extrapolate from air showers that we're looking for the same non-repeating nanosecond scale pulses we're looking for those following an interaction with a shower. So you could also have a muon radiating and every time a muon radiates a PEV shower, we'll see it. And um, you do know that your detection threshold, that your pulse amplitude scales linear with shower energy, as we know from um, air showers. So in, for, in order for your pulses to be detectable about background, sort of thermal noise, galactic emission, and these things, um, you need to have a certain energy. And that energy threshold is around PEV. And this has also been the reason why with all the previous experiments that sort of been sitting around of ice cube, nobody could have measured a coincidence simply because the energy threshold of radio is so much higher than it is of the optical detectors. So how does this then work? Um, so uh, you end up sort of with, with this, what, why, why does it, why is it like that? With the higher frequencies, you know that shower in a dense medium, they are smaller than air showers. So air showers stretch about over kilometers and in a really a small, in ice, they are maybe a couple of tens of meters long. So this means you have a more intense charge imbalance and you have less influence of the geomagnetic field. And of course here in air, the index of refraction is like 1.003 or something. But in ice, of course, it's more like 1.7. So it's much, much, um, much, much more different from one. So you really get this cone signal. So if you look at here at the bottom, this is what it looks like. You have a neutrino coming in, interacting. And then on this red cone that you see here at the bottom, the neutrino makes radio emission and that radio emission travels sort of in the ice to hear what's depicted as our antenna. And since ice attenuates the signal only very little, 
um, you have to take that into account when calculating um, your emissions. So what could you do then in order to detect neutrinos? So you could do something that some of my colleagues have been um, advocating for is you look at tau neutrinos emerging from the earth. So, or that is a tau entering the mountain, tau or a tau neutrino entering a mountain, undergoing an interaction, creating a tau particle that lives long enough to reach the mountain and then in air it decays and makes an air shower. So you could in principle look for um, anything Sort of, you could in principle also use particle detectors to do this, but radio detectors are probably most efficient when sort of you use them in these mountainous terrains and these things. So you have to, in order to do this, exploit the economies of scale. So, you, but you can because in principle, I don't know, this charging cable that I have here, it technically is an antenna. So you can build very, very, very cheap antennas. So you have to exploit it because you need to blanket sort of very many square kilometers. And the largest challenge you will face if you do something like this, as it's also depicted in the cartoon, so you have the tau shower leaving and you have antennas everywhere trying to catch it, is you have to suppress human-made background. Because unfortunately, very close to the horizon, that's also where your humans live. So you somehow have to um, be very good at um, separating out the neutrino signal from the humans. There are really a couple of projects going on or in a prototype stage or still proposed um, that sort of want to go in this direction to tackle um, ultra energy neutrinos. But I sort of decided to pick one of these to show you because they've, um, with their white paper a while ago, they've made quite the splash. And I think when it comes to radio detection of neutrinos, many people know about GRAND. So the GRAND concept is sort of 200,000 antennas over 200,000 square kilometers. and um, for example, they're thinking about hotspots now all over the sites in China, worldwide, that would use this, um, exploit this technique that the tower would leave the mountain and you would find it. So um, as far as I'm informed, um, Grand Poto 300, the hardware is developed, um, but the site search and the actual installation of this first proto step of 300 antennas is delayed due to COVID. Um, but they were anyway hoping for a staged approach where you build Grand Poto 300, learn something about it, then build something like Grand 10,000 and then Grand 200,000. So um, this is going to be very interesting, but since I'm not a member um, there, I don't have so much inside baseball to tell you about. Um, then there's Beacon or Tarogi or some others that have a very similar concept, only that instead of sort of blanketing the mountain, the concept is that you put a very sensitive array on top of the mountain and just looking down into the valley. Um, it has different technological challenges, but I think the overall um, sensitivity is the same thing. And it's um, going to be quite curious. I'm, I'm actually quite curious what sort of happens from the prototype arrays and what to make out of this. So let's come to in-ice detection of neutrinos. Um, and just to recap, what's nice about it is that cold polar ice has for radio emission attenuation length in the orders of kilometers. So which if you think about it, it could mean that one single radio station can monitor easily a cubic kilometer of ice and one cubic kilometer, that's the size of ice cube. So you could, in principle, if radio didn't have such a high energy threshold, replace the entire ice cube detector by uh, one radio station. So um, the detection threshold around sort of PEV, 10 PEV, really is not determined by the array spacing, but it's really the pulse, pulse height about thermal noise. So even if you put many antennas closer, there's really not much further you can go down in energy threshold. But that is fine because, you know, our optical colleagues are showing that, that they're doing a great work at those energies. So that's really no need for radio to push into this. But we are really there for the EV energies. So if you, and at EV energies, we know that we need an instrument that's roughly sort of a hundred cubic kilometers at least. So that means you would need to build ice cube a hundred times bigger. And that's, going to be really complicated. So with radio, you can do this with sort of, you know, 100 antenna stations. So we do want to go a little bit bigger, but just to get you the um, order of magnitude. So you need this 100 cubic kilometers to get sensitivity for cosmogenic neutrinos um, from the interaction with the C and B. And so we really need, in order, if we want to make uh, an impact there, we need to go this high. The nice thing about ice is sort of that you have human background is typically smaller in polar regions. So there are not many as many cities and not as many cars and other things around. So that makes event identification and self-triggering a bit less challenging. So there were many early experiments like Rice, Ara, Ariana. I've been part of some of them, but um, I wanna focus 
Oh, and of course, there's Anita. One should not forget Anita. But I want to focus on sort of the new experiments going forward that have been funded. So let's start with Anita, because whenever there's theorists around, um, I think the excitement has ebbed off on a little bit. But um, so uh, there, uh, if we're sort of looking at sort of PV energies or so, then the limits from radio textures are not competitive. And even below 10 to the 10 GeV, we're not competitive. The one exception is, is that sort of Anita, the Anita balloon that flew, oh, it's actually Anita one to four. So you have the, seen these mystery events. And um, uh, for those of you who are not aware of this mystery events, they're called like that because they behave like cosmic ray signals that Anita sees, but they show a polarization or more like a polarity, like a neutrino from deep through the earth. So the thing about this is, if it's truly a neutrino, then it's in strong disagreement with the ice cube limits on the ultra high energy flux. And it's on top of that, very difficult to reconcile with the standard model. So that's why there was lots of excitement when Anita reported these about these mystery events, because of course, physics beyond the standard model is always exciting. And it was something, new. but there are of course, a whole bucket of other explanations, more mundane um, ice backgrounds and other things. So I think if you do a search on archive, you'll find um, more of these. So, um, the interesting thing is when Anita 4 flew, um, it again shoved, uh, so saw four events with inconsistent polarity, but they were very near the horizon. So it wasn't mysteriously steep or you couldn't, you know, it wasn't this beyond standard model um, physics signature that everybody was looking for. However, it's still sort of, there are just too many events to for us to be totally comfortable with this thing. So um, very, I was very, very sort of pleasantly surprised to hear when, I, when uh, two years ago by now, um, Pueo was funded. So Pueo is a balloon, you see it at the at the top, is a successor to Anita and it has much, much better lower energy sensitivity and it will fly um, in I think end of 2024. And then if really it is true that these events are out there, Pueo will see lots and lots of them. So that's gonna be exciting. But I do not work on Pueo, so um, I'll talk about RNOG for a bit because that's what I work on. And this is sort of my, my little hobby going forward. So um, RNOG is the Radio Neutrino Observatory in Greenland. And um, it really is our first attempt to build a large scale radio detector. So RNOG construction started in 2021. And uh, so you don't see this here this well, but it's sort of, there are three stations. We installed them in 2021. And last year in the summer, we added four more. So RNOG is currently at seven stations here at Summit Station in Greenland, right there where the little blue star is in the middle of Greenland. We're planning to expand this to 35 station. So that really means we'll be sort of one of the first events, uh, first detectors with a really big impact on it. And um, the deployment in Greenland has allowed us for fast development turnaround. So because those of you involved in ice cube and others know that the COVID and everything, the cargo bottleneck to South Pole really has um, had a couple of complications. So in Greenland, everybody was very accommodating for us to go there. We already now have the largest yearly neutrino sensitivity beyond PEV energies. And clearly when we reach 35 stations, um, it's going to be um, a pretty good detector at those energies. It's sort of led by um, a small group of people. So interestingly, we do not have like one big NSF grant for it. We kind of played the game. Everybody had their own personal grants. We put them all together on the table and then we went for it. So um, it's led by um, Chicago and my group at DAISY. And then with uh, very invaluable contributions from Brussels and Penn State and Madison at this point. And I think by now we're a pretty big collaboration, many people joining and it's great to work in there. If you want to know more in detail, we have this concept and design paper that was before we actually had a single station in the field, but we're working on a follow-up. So this is what RNOG looks like. RNOG has sort of every single station is a combination of um, three detector strings. So you have at the top, you have the DAQ box, and then you have a string going down into the ice with multiple antennas on it um, on the three strings. And why does it look the way like it does? Um, we have um, at the one string we have at the bottom, we have a phased array. It has four of these V-pole antennas, so sensitive to the vertical polarization. And by phasing them up, we really look for the tiny signals. So this is the heart of our experiment with the trigger going for the tiniest signals. Um, we always have a combination. So you see little red and blue spots here. We have a combination of antennas for the reconstruction of the full electric field. So we have V-pole antennas and H-pole antennas, and they're sensitive to this polarization, that polarization, and these combined give you 
um, the necessary sensitivity. So we have RF over fiber strings for high signal quality and reconstruction. So all of these, we don't attenuate our signals and they're a hundred meters deep, these strings. Um, you can't read the number, so it's a hundred meters um, deep at this point. <clears throat> so the cosmic rate tagging, we have um, log periodic dipole antennas at the surface. So here at the surface, you have antennas that are there to veto and tag the cosmic rays. And then you have, we have further antennas distributed on these strings in order to do neutrino vertexing reconstruction and all the other things ongoing. So where do we stand with our energy at the point at this point? So we have in 2021, we've installed our first three stations. Um, and in 2024, additional four stations were upgraded and we started to install wind turbines. And it's really been great because we could send many of our students down to the field and help out. So we have uh, um, plans, what we're going to do. So in 2024, we'll upgrade um, all our stations to the final version of the hardware because, well, 2021 was really the height of the COVID ep epidemic. So it was uh, kind of complicated to do a lot of testing. So we have a lot of these um, little things in there that, you know, if one had actually been allowed with more than one person at the time in the lab, we could have tested in the lab. Um, but um, our stations are working and operating, just not yet at sort of the 99% level as we would like it. So there's a little bit room to improve it. So we want to add a wind turbine so we can run through the night. So right now, the wind turbines are not there yet. So we've, uh, we run on solar panels. So we had to um, shut off for the winter. Um, but we'll add this in 2023. And then in 24, 25, and 26, we'll install 10 plus minus two stations each year so that after that, our energy will be completed. Um, I think we'll sort of, you know, our, our, our secret plans are we'll operate at least until 2031 or until Ice Cube Gen 2 supersedes our energy, but um, we'll come that to, into that in a little bit. So how does this actually work with reconstruction? So we've done a little bit of homework and sort of how good will we be? So this radio detection is a mixture of radio interferometry and particle physics. So you can make, um, whenever you reconstruct things, you can make such an interferometric map, uh, interferometric map as you see at the bottom, which is here on the x-axis, it's radial distance and z as in depth in the ice. And you take all the signals in your antennas and you sort of phase them up as such and you make this interferometric map. And then that means you can really nicely reconstruct the vertex of your neutrino reconstruction which is needed for you to do energy estimation. And we've done this here. This is um, energy reconstructed shower versus simulated shower. And we sort of get to, a, let's say something between um, 20 and 30% energy resolution, which is just on the shower energy. And that's um, clearly a lot smaller than the unknown fraction of the neutrino energy from the elasticity that went into the shower later. So. This means that we'll will be, as air showers anticipated, will be very good in um, direction recon uh, energy reconstruction. So how about direction reconstruction? So this is, um, you can also see this here. It's quite complicated with radio. So I'm glad the cartoon is visible. Something in uh, uh, compressing this PDF apparently um, went all over the place. So you can see this here at the top, and this is sort of the most important part because if you remember, a neutrino comes in and you have this Cherenkov cone. So if you measure the arrival direction of the signal, it actually doesn't coincide with your neutrino direction. So you measure the direction of the cone and you measure it from far away. So we measure vertices at distances of like a kilometer. So you measure the cone and how it has propagated through the ice, but not um, the neutrino direction. So that means you have to disentangle it. And if you only knew your signal arrival direction, you would basically be able to constrain the neutrino here to this red band on the sky. It's big, I mean, it's gravitational wave signals big, but it's sort of very unhandy to actually track down sources. If you add what's called here the viewing angle, that is the frequency spectrum. So you can narrow this down because at the Cherenkov cone, you have all the high frequencies and further off the Cherenkov cone, you have more low frequencies. So if you know the frequency spectrum, you can narrow it down to a smaller ring. And if you add polarization, and that's then comes in with Ascarian emission, how the signal is polarized, you can narrow it down to this little spot on the sky. We, of course, won't be sort of as good as, uh, I, I don't know, muon signals, but you see this here for a single event contour, for example, um, the neutrino zenith angle and the neutrino azimuth, you get this very elliptical signature, but it also isn't too terrible. It's a couple of degrees in uh, space angle. 
So we really also, despite not having detected a single neutrino working towards multi-messenger astronomy at this point. So what will we be able to see? So um, we see here is that sort of, you know, Arno G is big enough to have a reasonable chance to detect the continuation of the flux. So here's the plot. You see the ice cube figures as a function of neutrino energy. And how to read this plot is, is that what you see here in red and black, that's the 90% 95% um, uh, um, confidence level contour. So if you know per bin by one one decade energy bins, um, if you uh, use a Feldman cousins limit, where would you end up? So this is our sensitivity and that's comparable to all the others here. But then also if we didn't measure, it's a different way of showing this. If we don't measure a single neutrino, we'll be able, after five years of running RNOG, we'll be able to exclude an ice cube like flux. And this is the purple line sort of at this level. So if you believe sort of the more uh, favorable um, ice cube spectral indices, after five years of RNOG, if it were to continue, we should have measured something. So the nice thing is we have sort of a complementary view to whatever is going to happen on the Southern hemisphere. So if you have a detector at South Pole or somewhere else in Antarctica, um, RNOG stands on itself and that's um, quite great. I think you have to be very optimistic for us to pick up something like a magnetar um, because, you know, we uh, we might, you have to put it very, very close in order for us to see something. But, you know, sometimes you can get lucky and you would see something. So one last bit about um, flavor sensitivity in radio detection of neutrinos. And that's sort of um, something we've shown here is that we're actually, um, we're actually sensitive to uh, all three flavors and that the flavor ratio, how we're sensitive changes as a function of energy. So you are at the lowest energies, we're mostly sensitive to um, electron neutrinos, but later on sort of secondary interactions of muons and taus that radiate and give showers actually become more relevant for us. And uh, it was sort of not a lot of people believed that we could do flavor, but at least we have significant contributions for all of them. And now it's just um, the challenge to actually disentangle this link. So where to after, this is sort of my last topic is, I wanna to briefly touch upon Ice Cube Gen 2, because of course, you know, we always have to think bigger and better. better. And um, the white paper the collaboration has um, put out is um, has part of it, a large radio array. And this is sort of the advertisement picture. And in the middle here, this hexagon that is optical ice cube, then around this larger area that is um, optical ice cube gen two, which is already going to be big and it's gonna be great to do continue on the science that ice cube has done. But what you also see here at the surface, that is a very large inner ice radio array. So the, the design of ice cube gen two as the collaboration depicts it has a large radio array part of it. And um, I'm also working on this moving forward. So um, as I said, it includes a large radio array. And if you look at the footprint here, it's always quite funny. It's sort of, this is ice cube. This is the blue ice cube um, at the bottom. And then you add ice cube gen two, which already makes ice cube look pretty, pretty small. And then you add the radio array and then you can't even see ice cube anymore. So it's a uh, uh, really, really large, which is a little bit intimidating, but you shouldn't think of it as in the same way because radio stations are much easier to install. So one of these dots you can probably install in sort of a day or so. So the experimental design currently is based on RNOG technology, and uh, but we will roughly have a factor of 10 or more stations in RNOG, so there will be a couple of challenges involved. And you see sort of the estimated sensitivity down here, um, which is, again, um, a lot lot more than RNOG. And I think I can safely say if Ice Cube Gen 2 doesn't measure a single neutrino, then we might as well place this whole um, thing with trying to find the ultra high energy cosmic ray sources to rest. So it was a very nice milestone. Um, we have um, sort of, we've been favorably uh, reviewed favorably uh, by the US Decadal Survey uh, and it's sort of going forward, but we're working on a technical design report. So I want to quote something that I really sort of uh, like from our white paper is that Ice Cube Gen 2 will play an essential role in shaping the new era of multi-messenger astronomy, fundamentally advancing our knowledge of the high energy universe. And uh, even though this figure by now looks slightly different in how we show it, I just, you know, it was a very one of the very first figures that we made for the white paper. I think it's sort of really great to just see if you pick a model and you have the A model and just have Gen 2 measure for 10 years, this is what a neutrino energy spectrum would look like. And this is this is pretty cool. 
So it's sort of, you know, then finally we can make this plot and compare the three multi-messenger, um, the three messengers together. And it doesn't always look like the neutrinos just have two and a half data points. So that brings me to my conclusions for this seminar today is sort of how do I plan or how do we plan to tackle the puzzle of the sources of ultra energy cosmic rays? And that's really on the neutrino side, this is sort of for me to conclude, there are really many ideas to go to beyond PEV, which to me just reinforces that uh, I think many people are excited to measure neutrinos beyond PEV energies. And uh, many of them are in radio, which is great because that tells me that I wasn't nuts when I started my PhD in radio emission of um, cosmic rays, but that this radio thing actually has the potential moving forward. So the in-ice technology is now mature, and with RNOG, we're building a very cool experiment in Greenland. Um, it is taking data already. Of course, it's not big enough yet to um, have a serious shot at discovery, but give us a couple of more years, and I'm sure there will be cool results from RNOG. And the next step to come will be IceCube Gen 2, and I highlighted sort of roughly sensitivities in that figure of where you can expect sort of RNOG to sit and where you can expect Gen 2 to sit. So that means um, there'll be a lot of models. If we don't see anything, a lot of models uh, under pressure, but I'm of course hoping that we do see something and that will be very exciting. So thank you all for listening and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Uh, yeah, just we, we, we this, uh, developments and then it, it looks like very realistic and the, your um, last um, uh, the figure with the plot with the sensitivities are extremely impressive, but before to continue just ask a question, it is in the unit per steradium right. It is sensitivity for diffuse background, I guess. Uh, uh, just last one. What about the um, point like sources? Um, because um, so, that is. Yeah, th thanks. So the point like sources, um, actually, one of my PhD students is making the plot as we speak. The problem for the point like sources is, is that we didn't have yet. Um, uh, angular reconstruction, or at least we couldn't agree on how good our angular reconstruction will be. And of course, for point like sources, it makes a lot of difference if you can uh, determine it to like one degree or 10 degree or something. So um, I think the point like sort of the point like sensitivity, these are coming out. So um, we're currently writing on a paper that actually will highlight the RNOG point like sensitivity. You can get a little bit of a glimpse from this figure here. This is sort of fluence upper limits. Um, that we would set, but um, I know which plot you mean, and I've seen a first version there for my grad student, but it's it's not quite ready yet. Uh, yes, but I mean, um, uh, you are talking about astrophysics. Of course, the uh, diffuse background is extremely uh, important, and uh, you could even probe cosmic rays um, in the in the entire universe when we probe the cosmic rays only within hundred megaparsec or so. Uh, so that is that is a very very important aspect of the science, no doubt about that. And there are no other ways. I mean, the gamma rays cannot help, and uh, so that is clear. Uh, nevertheless, if we go to astrophysics, I mean, this uh, sensitivity is really uh, very impressive. Uh, you are talking about to be compatible to ice cube. Um, I mean, well, compatible. I understand you want just to Paolo extrapolate and to see you are below or above that extrapolation, but that is uh, probably it's it's not should be in that way, in fact, because if you are want to detect neutrinos 10 to 20 EV, 10 to 19 EV, so uh, if it's most likely is P gamma interactions in these cases, uh, in that case, it's, it's, it's worked in different way. You get a target if you have the, sufficient targeted radio frequencies, you could produce a lot of 10 to uh, neutrinos. So that could become really astrophysically very, very powerful instrument. And um, typically we guess, we extrapolate, we have theories, but it's clear if you have a good sensitivity, somehow, somehow it will come up in a different way, even how we think. So that is extremely important to know what will be for point-like sources sensitivity. 
So that, well, of course, that's clear one degree and 10 degrees, completely different things, but nevertheless, so that was because I, I guess- Yeah, you, you see, I mean, you, you see this here, sort of this is, um, yeah, my, my PhD student says in prep. So this is a single event contour um, that sort of shows you that for a single event, um, if sort of where we, what our confidence would be where it comes from. And this is just uh, the simulated events and how, that's how we reconstruct it. So this gives you roughly an idea that we probably won't be sort of the one degree and certainly will be a little more, but we're also not gonna be at sort of the 20 stair degrees. So that's um, somewhere yes. at the level. That is my guess. Uh, and uh, even I'm not expert that I guess should be around one degree or a few degrees. So in that sense, it's com comparable to this, uh, the uh, fly, uh, sorry, ice cube. And in that case, really you will have, if it's true, then you have a sensitivity for discrete sources, one or two orders of magnitude but better. And that looks like extremely ex uh, exciting. And um, I think this is not just the case. We do that often. We just extrapolate to highest energies. In fact, why we should go to highest energies? That is no one. But in this case, we know there are cosmic rays 10 to 20 EV. So that is a not even extrapolation. And even could appear, signal could be there even stronger than at low energies, at PV energies. So I think that was to, to get a sensitivity such a nice sensitivity that that is already sufficient not to even discuss ast astrophysics because I said we'll we'll come up something even we don't. I, I hope maybe. so. I, I hope so. I have my fingers crossed and I'm confident that we'll find something. Yeah, but uh, just, just the last just question is just this is such an important issue, this angular resolution of reconstruction. Uh, you are talking all the time about your PhD student, but I think a lot of people should be involved. The community should be interested in this question. Should be many PhD students and professors to work on that, right? Because it's a critical issue. No, no, certainly it's sort of, but you know, one, one person has to carry all the workload. So uh, that's- uh, No, no I, said, uh, I say why others are not interested uh, uh, the, to, to, because it's a really critical issue. I mean, all, all, all science starts when you get a good, Resolution and good sensitivity. In anyway, rate, maybe that is a quite a bit <laughs> questions, yeah. general question. Anyway, so uh, please questions. Uh, could I ask a question, um, Paulo? Yeah. Uh, in the old days, like people got scared away. I looked at it briefly. The scaring effect is a big mess, and it involves co possible coherent. Stuff which you can't really do in a Monte Carlo simulation. Or how, how do people handle coherent effects and how confident are you actually in the calculation? And in the very old days, like if you did the scaring effect in the sand and ice, you got different answers. People didn't know how to go between the different regimes. Is that confident now or what's the state of the art? Yeah, so it's um, actually sort of, I, I think most of the credit has to go through sort of to uh, uh, folks around uh, Tim Hu and Clancy James who implemented this in Corsica, but implemented it on a sort of really on a microscopic level where uh, sort mm -hmm. of all the individual um, particles are being tracked. And the same goes, I think they've also done it with Iris, um, with sort of, uh, it's called now ZH Iris um, with the ZHS formalism included in Iris. And Iris and ZHS actually for air come out at um, sort of less than 10% differences. And you could mm -hmm. also, as far as you can do it with Corsica, you can change the medium. And it really, it, it comes out the same. It's sort of the, the math is now sort of coherence. You don't have to put it artificially in it. Sort of, it comes automatically out. And wow. uh, this is with the treatment, especially with the treatment of the refractive index. This was sort of the key ingredient. And uh, yeah, I think there's... Uh, Right, you know, we 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 may have sort of second order effects at some point that we can't probe yet, but I'm uh, pretty confident that there's no no theoretical issue right now standing at the moment, which also explains why sort of the number of papers discussing this has gone down because I think it's considered an issue solved. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Great. Um, some other questions. Um, and now I, I see in this, there are no questions. Let me ask one uh, question again. I, I, I think we just discussed that. So you said that the geosynchrotron now contributes about 1% or so, right? So 
uh, then um, could we say that this debate is over? Is a synchron or coherent emission? Yes, I, okay. I think I think we've 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 shown now that the synchrotron emission um, that sort of if you know how to filter for it, you can find it, and it really is in these corner cases as the at the very highest frequencies. So if you go to several gigahertz or in a super thin atmosphere where the index of refraction is almost one, then you can see it sort of it becoming a little more dominant, but it, yeah, it, it never, the bulk of the emission is never geosynchrotron. So that emission and uh, that discussion has been settled. Okay, that's good because it was <laughs> oscillations. What, what is, yes. Yeah. And then uh, could you say a bit more about the plans? I mean, that what, how, uh, when, when, when you hope to see this super sensitivity, which you plot, I mean, Gen, gen, gen 2 sensitivity, it's, Maybe you said that I didn't get the, the exact numbers. It, oh, it, it depends. It depends a little bit uh, about whether um, Ice Cube Gen two moves forward. So, it's um, is right now Ice Cube Gen two is sort of an idea that we have, and it's sort of being circulated at NSF. And uh, you heard it at the live stream last week about the results that sort of NSF is committed to Ice Cube Gen two somehow, but you know that hasn't materialized in. Uh, actually a funding decision yet. So um, it depends a little bit on this process and when it goes forward. But um, this this really cool sensitivity we're planning on, you know, once everything is funded and going, going, we're planning on seven seasons of installation of Ice Cube Gen 2. So that means from whenever you start and you would start maybe in the first installation, we could maybe start in, if somebody said go now, then in maybe three or four years from now, and then plus seven years of installation. So we're talking about a detector that's finished the earliest in 10 years from now. But and of course, you know, we know the reality, it goes forward. And this is these sensitivities are for 10 years of operation. So we're talking about things that we'll see in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now. Yeah, sure. But 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 you you don't expect some unpleasant surprises, right? I mean, it's a technological or understanding of the technique or so more or less settled this all these questions. Oh, you never know what's coming, but I think no, no, it now, uh... certainly should be some problems. But I mean, generally, it is it is uh, nothing uh, special. Yeah. No, no, so so far, with all the also with our G now, what we're building in Greenland, where you know the problems that we're having were known problems, but sort of it's just due to a limited. I don't know. For instance, there was we know that SD cards are not super reliable at cold temperatures. And people knew it, but then there wasn't time to do something else. So the SD cards just didn't like the cold temperature. So real, really, there's nothing, there's nothing that I would say sort of is that we technologically have to overcome still. Um, it's going to be challenging to build such an detector, but it's nothing where we're like, oh, okay, this is going to be weird. And we had for a while, we had a discussion about whether we'd have a significant muon background that would complicate our lives. But now after two years of simulating things, it looks like we may have a muon background, but it's not going to be a dangerous one. So this, these are sort of, I think there's nothing, nothing um, at least that we know of that's lurking around the corner. Yeah. So, there Anna, last, yeah. There's a question, uh, Rashmi? Uh, no, well, no, I just, uh, go ahead, Felix, after you. I had a question about Arno G. I just, yeah, my, my last question is just uh, at the peak of the sensitivity, peak, I mean the best sensitivity, um, what kind of photon, uh, so, sorry, neutrino statistics do you expect? I mean, um, so. No, I didn't. Know, I didn't I, I, yes, sorry. I, yes. So I, I, didn't, I didn't bring that plot, but if you, for instance, look at um, like this model here for the most optimistic one from TA, um, that if you believe TA composition and you then create cosmogenic neutrinos with it, we're talking about um, for Ice Cube Gen 2, we're talking about hundreds of neutrinos. Hundreds of neutrinos per, per, per uh, detection. Uh, yeah. Per energy beam, but uh, per detection. I mean, you detect, let's say, five sigma, and then it will be 100 neutrinos or? No, no so uh, that's, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, so. Um, we can, um, a single neutrino, um, whether we detect it or not, depends on the, um, basically on the vertex distance. So the further away a vertex is, the more complicated it is for us to detect. But the minute we detect it, and then we have a, um, what, what do we assume? I, in the analysis efficiency, we assumed a three sigma above noise level to detect it for the radio pulse. 
So it's not it's not super aggressive. It's sort of it's uh, um, achievable. So I think we can go down to something like two sigma or so, and we would still see it. But then the reconstruction is a little more complicated. Okay. But uh, how you uh, how these uh, predictions uh, the fluxes uh, have been calculated? I mean, because there's a lot of uncertainty. The uh, TA cosmic rays are just what we see locally. But depending on evolution, if you have sharp evolution, could be much more. So, so this is um, this is the the work, uh, the work that you see here from from I and from Fleet, who takes the sources and the evolution, and then uses um, CR proper to propagate all the particles through the universe. So, um, I I would refer to how he did it, but. Um, and this is also why I plot several lines as sort of all the different analyses with different people and it all comes out in sort of the same ballpark here. So I think the work from Iron from Fleet for TA is actually almost the same like what Doug Bergman for, from TA itself calculated. And so it's, I think two different people come up with yeah. it, something similar. When it's conservative, you assume constant everywhere in the universe, that is the minimum, but with evolution, in fact, could be more. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I learned this already that when you ask somebody sort of what is the appropriate source evolution that you should, should assume, then at least two theorists stand up and tell me something different. So, uh. yeah. But there's the one thing with the, the, uh, the Fermi flux will stop you to fantasize. Yes. I mean, because the cascade will just stop. <laughs> yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes, Rashmi. Yes. Just... Yeah. Sorry. I just had a question about Arno G. So, if I understand correctly, that that that's that's been funded and it's uh, uh, it, it kind of is complementary in some ways to Ice Cube Gen two, or uh, it'll come before that's Ice Cube Gen two most likely. Yeah. And so, so yeah, we're, we're building R G now. So we're actually deploying it as now. So we have a yeah. it's it's a it's a fun project because it's mostly paid by Europeans. So there's a my grants and from a Belgian colleague, and then. The U.S. partners come in and they uh, sort of do a lot of technology development, and we're doing it at a U.S. station. So it's kind of a fun international. So it's in that sense different from Ice Cube, where there was a big NSF grant to go to South Pole. So our energy yeah. is a little more distributed. But, but you're already exploring energy that is higher than what Ice Cube is doing, right? Yes. So okay. So so in terms of, I mean, in some in some sense, you can even test things for Ice Cube Gen two before Ice Cube Gen two. Yes. Yeah. So so this is but it's basically. Yeah, but so I think basically it's sort of a practical problem almost. It's sort of the that um, we know if you look at this figure is that we have to be lucky in a way to find something with RNOG. It may just be that the neutrino predictions are just too optimistic and they're below that. So in order to actually really make sort of a hard line, you need something the size of Ice Cube Gen 2 and something that big, a factor of 10 bigger than what we're building right now, you can only do that with sort of a serious coordinated grant. And that's why sort of our future plans for radio are part of Ice Cube Gen 2. But yeah, right. Ice Cube Gen 2 isn't funded yet. So um but can you rule out certain areas for Ice Cube Gen 2 to look at if, with your Arno G or is that too ambitious? yeah I think so if you if you what what we probably we probably can rule out sort of the most optimistic sort of two high proton like emission um emission models that are coming. Um that's that's that we will be able to do. So it it essentially also, but we're what we're actually hoping to do is that since it's basically the same people doing RNOG and going Ice Cube Gen 2 radio, that we actually then do joint analyses so that we can profit from the sensitivity. Yeah, of both that of would be around. fantastic. Yeah, great. Thank you. And what are the scales? I mean, the price of the full instrument. Um, so our no, approximately our no, order of magnitude, not, not yeah. So our no, our no G is roughly five million, and Ice Cube Gen two probably is something like four, uh, four. So the radio part is just going to be forty million, but Ice Cube Gen two as a whole is something like 300, 400 million. Hmm. So that's uh, I mean that's that's a little too big to chew for. <laughs> just uh. This, uh, what we're doing now, but yeah, the uh, five million, the uh, five million for uh, RNOG, we were able to raise like like um, via different routes. It's it's the best probably instrument for high standard cos cosmic rays, probably yeah. even more important than cosmic ray detectors. I'm a bit surprised that not so much interest. I mean, 
uh, because it's 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 really <laughs> I'm typically very critical to neutrino astronomy, but for this one, I think it's when I see sensitivity, it's 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 and that is a great science. So it's a very unique 10, 10 to 20 EV science. It's surprised that is a not so much interest. <laughs> The, I, I think I, I have my own hypothesis about it is that sort of radio is it's very different like if you look at optical astronomers for example they have no problem in sort of branching over to you take looking at uv data or infrared data but the minute you move over to radio data it's always oh that's complicated and you know how does this work and i think it's something similar happening with in in sort of the experimental field in um particle physics is that sort of People are so used to working with PMTs and you can do, you know, PMTs in gamma ray telescopes, in neutrino telescopes, in uh, uh, OG, even in sort of um, cosmic ray detectors. But that but then the radio is such a different technique that it's sort of hard to find your way in somehow. So um, I think many people, you talk to many people and they're excited and they say it's cool what we're doing, but sort of actually working on it, I think there's just a little, a little hurdle for people to get in. Yeah, ne nevertheless, it's funny when even now, neutrino people talking so much about Antares taking upper limits and Antares sensitivities, five order of magnitude below your sensitivity in Earth per, per second. So, I mean, for me, the number one is sensitivity. Is then after that we could discuss, and I'm really surprised. And the energies are really so excitement about UZK or, or all the related topics. And this this will be much much more powerful than any other cosmic ray instrument in in as a as a information. I mean, just you you get yeah. Anyway, so it's very personal view. Um, so I, questions. I have another one. If you want. Uh, I missed it, but uh, how does how good is the how does it work? The gamma hadron separation of the equivalent. How do you tell it's a cosmic ray neutrino? How well can you do that? Um, to separate what you're actually seeing and how um, do you test that? <laughs> so so basi basically, it's uh, relatively easy is that the neutrino comes from the ice. So and nothing nothing okay. else comes from yeah. the ice because we have a we have uh -huh. a very good vertexing. So we can, mm. by like a couple of meters, we can tell where the vertex is and mm. also the arrival direction. So it could be like a cosmic ray that enters the ice and makes emission, but that is actually, it is at the surface. It sits right there at the surface. But mm -hmm. neutrinos, mm -hmm. they would come, let's say, sort of from the side and make a vertex and come from this arrival direction. So um, we have very little physics background that we can actually sort of get confused between is it a neutrino or is it a is it a cosmic ray. So we will we'll be, I think, uh, that's that's the least of our problems. Okay. But that is another nice feature of this energy band of technique, right? Because not to suffer so much from background so it is it is interesting though because if you look at a sort of muon calculations for example sort of how many high energy muons do we have in in in, in air showers there are really very few predictions beyond pev and when i asked uh, i i had this conversation with anatoly fedinich it's like so anatoly how about you uh tell me sort of in a 10 to the 20 electron volts air shower, how many muons above 10 PV are in there? He basically laughed at me and said, nobody ever sort of calculates this because of um, sort of the transition already with prompt production and these things. So we we are probing an energy regime where sort of for some background things, not everything is uh, if clear. So uh, it'll, it'll be fun. We'll pushing, we'll be pushing a couple of <laughs> predictions to higher energies. Well, for muons, actually, even without unknown cross sections, there is another interesting issue. It really is not calculated. Even you take the standard photo production cross section, you get uh, muons sometimes from gamma rays more than from protons. It just depends. I mean, just above the detectors, and there are controversy of different calculations. And so, even even without this question about beyond accelerator cross sections and still there are a lot of interesting issues but but the same is for Auger and uh, where we don't know real cross sections so it's it's one yeah, question. I, I think I think muon, muons, <laughs> muons are underrated in the way how they cause problems for us and yeah we'll I think we'll have to revisit this from time to time they start on the but he is good that you have background free even you don't know 
exact numbers if background free then plus minus not so critical if it's heavily background dominated then that is important so it's it's really interesting yeah let me um, I'm, I'm i'm trying to find whether i can now uh fast find a a plot to show you actually what sort of the background um is going to be let me see um i need this here so we because we made it we made a we made a plot with the number predictions but also that have so oh, Anna, we're not seeing a screen if you're sharing a screen yeah yeah i'm, I'm still i'm still okay. looking for the figure sorry because <laughs> i uh i know that i have it somewhere here yeah. um so um you see this now right no no no, no. So let me, one second. So here we are. Yeah. So that works now, right? Um, so you see here, um, basically a couple of predictions for RNOG, sort of at the end of 2028. Um, and this is sort of the most pessimistic background, the dashed lines that we see in here. So it may be, this is really sort of the most pessimistic that we could think of. Um, these are the muons that could sort of they could contaminate the first couple of energy bins with background, but at the high energies, there's nothing you can come up with. And this is for instance this is for RNOG 2028. Um, so that's less than 10 years of operation. You would see that we would measure like one or two neutrinos here in the most optimistic cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there there could be there could be there could be background at some point, but uh we, we're not we're not aware of it yet. Can I ask Minerva? You have very heavy background. This that 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 would be. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, uh, are there any computation constraints? Because uh, like low far and SK, everything was reconstructing all the phases that's the problem with the radio it's super complicated so is that an issue for you or ice cube Just um so uh so i think um the interesting thing is is sort of now with 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 radio as a whole we're sort of we're now this relatively small community of people that do does all of this together hmm. so um there are a couple of people sort of who of course have orthogonal ideas of how to do this um but um with um with the reconstruction, I think we're sort of, you know, everybody is following the same approach. And I think we will 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 think it's it's going to be doable. It's not going, it's not that much data. So we mm -hmm. have per station like a terabyte of data per year. So it's not crazy. Oh. So it's 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 sort of it's it's interesting, is we have this cool sensitivity, but if we're not sort of a huge overhead experiment. Mm -hmm. So as I always have to tell my Daisy director, it's not too expensive to operate a detector like we do. It's more expensive to build one. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there are a couple of people sort of who have disagreeing opinions of where we should go, but I think by now sort of we've crystallized towards sort of this core that all will go together. And uh, LOFAR, SKA, and these things, they will not be able to venture into the neutrino space. You have to have dedicated detectors mm -hmm. to do this. There. But you don't need the full phase UV coverage or whatever and reconstruct that, that makes things complicated in, in LOFAR. No, uh, so I mean, there's there's two. I always I always say I'm the person that misappropriates a radio telescope for their purposes, um, because uh, so LOFAR is of course great because you have all these. So for astronomy, you need these huge baselines in order to actually get these tiny resolutions that LOFAR has. But air showers are this very local phenomenon. So when when I do LOFAR measurements of air showers, I only use the central core, so the central mm -hmm. fifteen stations or so, and I don't need the long baselines. So that mm -hmm. makes it. Uh, much less complicated in this whole thing of where do we need an additional station for covering all of these things. And also the same holds for SKA. So all the astronomers are really sad that SKA is being sort of cut down and being smaller and smaller. And I say, as long as they keep the core intact, we'll do great air shower physics with it. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, just maybe one. Uh, do you have uh, any um, energy resolution, or it's very bad? 
Like, so the energy the energy resolution is going to be good. So we are mm -hmm. basically dominated by the unknown fraction from how much the neutrino will deposit in the shower. So this is the same that Ice Cube has. It's sort of when you have a neutrino, it makes a shower. You don't know how much energy is carried away by the neutrino and how much went into the shower. And so that's the dominating the factor. 50% or? So it depend, it's energy dependent, but yeah, it's sort of the, the unknown elasticity fraction can be a factor of two. Okay. And so, so because our shower energy resolution is 20%, so clearly the factor of two is uh, the dominating problem. But since we'll be not very large statistics, so that should be okay. I mean, for yeah. extraction of the spectrum or so that, that is fine. Yeah. No, I think overall radio is much better in uh, for energy than it is for um for 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 direction. But direction we need to work hard on. So I agree. That's uh, I, I always say the worst case scenario is is that in R G we measure a neutrino and we go, we have a neutrino, and then everybody, all the astronomers ask, so where did it come from? And we say, well, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> So we don't want to end up in this scenario. So we really need to have our uh, our answers straight for when we measure a neutrino that we actually also can pinpoint it. You can do that like rotation waves. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> even the better even. Yeah. No, no but no, I think a few degree, few degree most likely it will be probably. Yeah, it, it depends. It's, it's, really, it's really interesting. It's sort of the... We're doing this systematically now, and it really depends on it depends on zenith angle and on energy in a bit. And actually, sort of carving all that out is um, nice. But I'm I'm happy to send. So I have a my PhD student who just graduated. She's writing up this paper now. So I'm happy once it's finished. I'm happy to send it your way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One so question related. To that. Oh, oh sorry. Ahead. No, no, sorry, Paul. Just uh, um, like Monte Carlo calculations are great, but sometimes it's good not to rely on that and have an end-to-end -end test. I mean, with LOFAR, how did you know that what the energy of the cosmic ray was that you were reconstructing? I mean, what's it, was there another detector near there? Or uh, yeah, so so for for LOFAR, we did put particle detectors on the ground. Ah, so. Um, that is, interestingly, that wasn't never the intention to actually do an energy reconstruction with it. Huh. It was because the astronomers were really worried because we we trigger LOFAR. We trigger LOFAR to read out the buffers. So the astronomers were really worried that we would continuously trigger them with nonsense. So we said, okay, let's put down a particle array. So we know that there's an air shower and we trigger it and we read it out. Wow. Okay. So so then then we actually, we did this cross ca calibration of um, LOFAR and um and the particle particle array, and that worked really, really well. And okay. the same, and the same at the PRG Observatory. So um, I think, yeah, I, I agree with you. Sort of, Mon we call it Monte Carlo Dreamland. Yeah. Reality is never like Monte Carlo Dreamland. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know you had a particle. That's great. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Well, about Monte Carlo in Cherenkov telescopes, <laughs> it worked so well, surprisingly well, and that is even more complicated, right? I mean, all these images, shapes absorption but surprisingly it, it it works so well it's 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 really not so bad in fact yeah i mean oh, the, the monte carlo the monte carlo yeah. developers had ages in order to figure it out so uh... <laughs> depends who does it <laughs> yeah because i know some of the first monte carlos did not work so well <laughs> i know that for a fact so, yeah no, no, but I can say in 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 Hes, in Higra, we are just surprised to see such a mm -hmm. nice agreement with the cosmic ray detection rate. So it's no, it it works quite quite well. Or when you compare with with blast, uh, oh, sorry, with Fermilat, mm -hmm. I mean the password. So it it is quite fine. At hundred GV, you get very very nice results with different techniques. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the the electromagnetic part also is always easy. We also say this sort of. I think the the problem really is the hadronic part. No, no, I was talking about cosmic rays, cosmic oh, ray okay. rate, cosmic ray rate. I mean that was, uh, and you know it, we had a paper with Higra for proton spectrum, very old, some twenty plus years old, and there's a, now a lot of discussion about proton spectrum measured by. Uh, uh, different uh, satellite instruments 
And imagine, I mean, uh, the proton spectrum, which was detected by Higra by imaging telescopes. It's, it's so close. It's, it's, it's um, you know, and talk about hadronic. But of course, you know, cross sections at low energies. That is another question. Yeah. So Felix, I, I hate to break this, but I have to go at 10, yeah. 30. No, no, we just are now. Can I to... yeah. It's late in Europe. No, it's, it's 4.30. At some point, uh, the kids are coming home. So then. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you really for an excellent talk. And I hope you can join next week, uh, November 16th. We want to do kind of like a recap of the ice cube results and uh, with some speakers, so it'll be nice. Yeah, well, uh, after seeing, so next Wednesday, DAISY is being reviewed. We have sort of every half year, we have an institute review, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see, I'll see yes. whether the review committee already allows us to be out or whether uh, what we're doing. Yeah. But I'll, All right, I'll well, good luck with that. Yeah. Thanks, thank thanks you. so much. Thank and, you, uh, everyone. Very good talking to all of you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank, right. thank you very much. Yeah.